Hello, I'm Bill Whalen. I'm the Hoover Institution's Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Distinguished Policy Fellow in Journalism. I'd like to welcome you back to the Hoover Book Club, where we bring Hoover Fellows and friends together to discuss their latest writings. Our guest today is Morris Fiorina. Morris Fiorina, or Mo Fiorina, to his friends as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Wendt Family Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. His research focuses on elections and public opinion with particular attention to the quality of representation, i.e. how well the positions of elected officials reflect the preferences of the public. He joins us today to discuss a new book he's edited. It's titled, Who Governs? Emergency Powers in the Time of COVID. Mo, congratulations on the book, and thanks for joining the book club today. Thank you, Bill. Happy to be here. Well, thank you for joining us again. So let's talk about the book and let's begin this way. This book is a departure for you. I'm not going to say how many years you've been teaching. Um, it, I think we can talk in groups of decades more so than years, my friend. Uh, but this is a departure for you. This is not something you have done, is it? That's uh, absolutely right. And, and I will speak in terms of uh, years. I've been a professor for 51 years, and this is uh, something I've never looked into before. It's very different from anything I've done before. Okay, and let's describe exactly what the book is. Uh, I would point out to those who haven't read it yet, uh, if you want to read about the pros and cons of various COVID policies, lockdowns, vaccines, the merits of government spending, this is not the book for you. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, go check out Scott Atlas or Jay Bhattacharya or Hoover colleagues who go down that line and they talk about the pros and cons of policies. What Mo has done is he's brought together political scientists and researchers and legal scholars to discuss what COVID policies have meant in terms of governing. And Mo, what, what sparked the idea for this book? Uh, what sparked it was that uh, if you go back almost three years to the day, I believe it was March 16th, three years ago, yep. uh, we're all, it's a normal day at the office, and then suddenly the uh, the word comes through from Stanford, uh, shut down your computers, close up your offices, and go home. And uh, there was some milling around in the halls, and uh, so there's some joking, well, surely Hoover fellows are essential workers. They couldn't really mean, uh, mean we should go home. Uh, but in fact, we were told, yes, you should all go home. And over the next couple of days, as I, I just observed what was going on, that the um, local economy had been totally shut down, uh, constitutional rights such as uh, assembly and freedom of expression or religion had been suspended. And uh, I thought, thought this was all pretty amazing. And this had all been done uh, under the authority of county officials who were appointed, uh, not elected, and their actions were authorized by pre-existing statutes and constitutional provisions, uh, giving them this authority. Uh, so I, I sat down and I wrote a lot, a, an email to Condi, our director, and just noted that there were just real implications here for democratic governance, which is one of the three pillars on which the Hoover Institution stands. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody ought to be on this. Now, anybody who knows me knows that when I write something like that, I mean somebody else at Hoover ought to be on this because I was born without any kind of organizational genes whatsoever. But Bundy uh, didn't know that, and she just wrote back and said, you're right, Mo, why don't you get on it and we'll support you. And uh, I didn't want to disappoint the boss, uh, so even though I've never done anything like this in this study, I thought, okay, I'll take a look. And the first thing an academic does, obviously, is go get the data. So I asked around, I wanted to find a website or a big reference book about all these state emergency powers. And I learned fairly quickly there wasn't any such thing. And at that point, I thought, well, this project's not going to go anywhere. And here's where just a fortunate accident uh, made the project possible. Uh, I live in Portola Valley, which is in San Mateo County. Right. And uh, our restrictions were just not quite as severe as most of our, as in Santa Clara County, where most of our colleagues live. And so I would invite colleagues to come up and go for walks in the countryside and sit on our deck and have wine and cheese, uh, all socially distanced, of course, but this is right. how we kept in touch for uh, probably a better part of a year. And one day I was walking with Bruce Kane, who is the director of the Lane Center for the Study of the American West. Right. And I mentioned, he asked me what I was doing, and I mentioned, well, I'd started to do this, but it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, there was just no data. And uh, Bruce said, well, wait a minute. He said... Uh, he had already hired interns, his inter his center had hired interns whom they normally put in state agencies, and now everything was remote. So he was committed to support these students for the summer and didn't have anything to do with uh, anything for them to do. And he said, you can have them. And so here was a subsidy from another unit of Stanford to the Hoover Institution. Uh, we I had a graduate research assistant. We were working on gun control at the time. And so uh, we pivoted and uh, my assistant put together this team of undergraduates who began the arduous task of 
reading all the state constitutions, and then we learn quickly that most of the provisions are in, in statutes, they're enabling statutes, not constitutions. So tracking down and reading all the statutes and putting together a database. So you want to know, and this is up on the Hoover website now, if you want to know what Arkansas can do or what California can do, et cetera, then uh, we can tell you. And uh, and so we, uh, at that point, I started looking around for other people. I, I felt at times like, you remember, in the, you, you've seen the old Magnificent Seven movie with Yul Brenner goes around yes. uh, picking up other gunfighters, uh, has, doesn't have anything to pay them with, doesn't have anything to offer, he just picks them. Well, I had a Magnificent Nine, and I just approached people who I'd heard about or read about, and asked them, would you do a paper uh, on this subject? And uh, this group of fine scholars, uh, in some cases, graduate students, in other cases, fine scholars and, and younger scholars, older scholars, they just contributed a, a really nice set of essays, I think, which really cover the ground, everything from the historical and philosophical background to emergency powers, to how they were actually implemented in states like Texas and California. Uh, I, I approached at one point, we didn't have any lawyers. And so I approached uh, again after asking around the Brennan Center at uh, NYU. And uh, the director there, Lisa Gottwein, was really uh, just above and beyond the call of duty. She gave us a, a advanced law student to keep track of all the court cases arising from the uh, from the exercise of emergency powers. And Victoria Ochea just put together a really nice essay. And again, a database, if you want to know all the court cases and what they were about, uh, this too was up on the Hoover website. And so in the end, I think th this book is a starting point to that. Uh, yes. The, 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 the large part of the, the emergency has run its course, uh, but surely there will be others in the future. And there are a lot of questions that are going to be asked now uh, about what we did and who should have done it and so forth. And was it was it right for, in a democracy? And so I think uh, in all kinds of public policy courses, law school courses, political science courses, et cetera, and just for just for the, the concerned layperson, uh, this book sort of lays out a lot of the issues and can start a conversation that I think we really need to have. It would not also say for the layperson out there, it's very, it's just very easy to read. It's just these essays are just very, very well spelled out, Mo. They're not, uh, they're not thick. They're not uh, written for people with an IQ of 180 or higher. It's just, it's very easy to digest. So at the heart of this book, Mo, is the question of who has legitimate authority to take action during periods of emergency. Uh, and I would note you began by saying that California is approaching its uh, three-year anniversary of the lockdown. Uh, this debate continues, even though California is going to, uh, uh, California ended its uh, state of emergency for COVID at the end of February. Um, we have a colleague, Michael McConnell. We have colleagues, John Kogan and John Taylor. They filed an amicus brief um, in, a in two cases before the Supreme Court right now, Mo, which have to do with what? The Biden administration's using, uh, justifying uh, student loan forgiveness last year uh, by tapping into the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act was a product of the 9-11 era, which allows the Secretary of Education to cancel student loan repayments during, quote, a war or other military operation or national emergency. And so what McConnell and Kogan or Taylor are saying is, is this really a proper use of emergency powers, if you will? So this question is going to continue with us, even though we're getting through COVID itself, even though we're getting through these various state emergencies, federal emergencies, we're still going to be wrestling with this issue about who exactly has power during times of emergency for, for the foreseeable future, I think. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Okay, so let's get into the book itself, Mo. So it's divided into three parts. Um, one, uh, state emergency powers. Two, emergency powers and practice. Three, response to the exercise of emergency powers. How did you decide those three topics? Um, I think it's pretty natural, really, that, uh, as I said, um, my inclination as an academic is, uh, first, what's the lay of the land? What do the data actually show? And so the first several chapters just fell into place uh, naturally. And also our, our my friend John Fairjohn who contributed a, a legal uh, chapter. And then the, uh, the uh, we, we heard about, uh, we knew Didi Quo was doing a study of California, and we have a Hoover fellow, David Leal, who's uh, headquartered in Texas. And so it's pretty natural to sort of contrast a, a deep blue state and a deep red state, well, not so much a deep red state, but a red state clearly, uh, and how they approach the subject. And then uh, there was obviously a lot of publicity about public opinion. And again, a lot of, maybe not quite as much about court cases, but clearly a great deal was happening in the judicial system. And uh, it, it's actually very interesting. I, I think the uh, one of the things that comes out of the uh, the chapter on uh, on the courts is, um, and maybe I'm getting ahead of uh, ahead of myself here on too much specificity, but uh, we often hear criticisms today about activist judges, 
right. and the judges are uh, are not not just interpreting law; they're making the law. Well, here was almost the exact opposite situation, where increasingly judges, the judiciary, began to rein in administrators. That they they began to question whether administrators actually had the authority to act to do the things they were doing. Was there uh, a real was there real evidence? Uh, remember, a Los Angeles judge sort of led the way, saying, "I, I want to see the evidence." For what 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 you're doing has any impact, and like Victoria in the essay sort of begins to call for strict scrutiny, that these are really basically life and death powers that are being exercised by officials, and the judges really ought to treat them in the same way as they treat fundamental questions of, of free speech, free expression, and so forth, and not just uh, not just the rational basis. Uh, does the administrator does, does the bureaucracy have sort of a rational basis? But in fact, uh, really given the implications for for personal liberties and so forth, that the judges should be exercising a more, a much more strict scrutiny of, the, of administrative decisions, bureaucratic decisions. Right now, you uh, you co-authored an essay with Cameron DeHart, I believe, Mo. She is a, a Stanford PhD in political science, um, and in the essay, you too point out that this is a reminder that America is a republic, and the republic consists of states, and states have various rules as to how emergencies are declared and extended and ultimately rescinded. Is this a good system, Mo? Uh, you know, I, well, I basically beg, beg off questions like that because it's the <laughs> system we have, and it's not going anywhere. I mean, it is, this belongs in the same uh, uh, the same category as uh, the Senate. The Senate yes. is malapportioned. Well, it is, but right. we're not going to change it. <laughs> you know, so I, uh, the, the point is, uh, in contrast to other countries, of course, like Britain, France, uh, you know, they can, uh, I remember we were in a Zoom every week with uh, European colleagues and we keep track of, of what's yes. going on over there. And the way France carried out this, you can just have one central order, it's the same across the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And that's just totally different from the way things we do in the US. And one of the things that actually we, we found out very quickly was that emergency powers are nearly, mostly sort of located in the States. And the federal government actually has very little in the way of specific emergency power uh, authority. And so this just has historically been something exercised by the states. Now, granted, it's it's typically been more natural disasters and so forth, um, and not so much, you know, in California, we continually have these the Medfly infestation, earthquakes, floods, et cetera. And that's more typical of uh, right. what emergency powers have been aimed for in the past. Right. The federal government was about the only ones worried about insurrection and, um, and foreign invasion. So uh, it's mostly a state level thing we're talking about, and that's the system we have, and we're not going to leave it anytime soon. So uh, whether it's good, bad, all I know is it's different. And uh, through your research, Mo, have you found, is there a good definition for emergency? Have the states reached any sort of consensus of what actually constitutes an honest to goodness emergency? No, no. Because we'll get, uh, we're going to get to yeah. California in a minute where we're going to see how this is really yeah. widely expanded. But when you look at the 50 states, is there a pattern? Uh, not really. I mean, an emergency is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. And, and in, in the case of COVID, early on, uh, there we were being deluged with information about, I mean, millions were all going to die. And I think everybody sort of uh, took, took a cue early on and said, yes, they, all the states very quickly declared states of emergency. But then things began to, uh, to sort of disentangle fairly quickly after that as, as the as the, the infections begin to spread and so forth, and spread more in some areas, less in some areas, and we began to learn a little more about the disease. But the uh, one of the concerns raised by judges, philosophers, and others is simply that um, executives, uh, boy, this looks really sort of attractive that I can go here in an emergency and don't have to worry about all these interfering legislators and others, right. and I can just do what I want. And so there is that, uh, you know, the well, let's just say that the incentives uh, for for executives to declare emergencies are clearly there, and uh, and so we we depend to some extent on the uh, the personalities and the personal values of the executives and uh, the coalitions that put them in office. Right now, let's look at California for a second, uh, where you and I live. Uh, so back in October, Governor Newsom announced that he was going to put an end to the state's COVID emergency, uh, but then he put some distance into it. He said it's going to end at the end of February, and people said, wait a second, why are you waiting till February? He said, where's the effect, Mo, of, well, we've got to wait and see what happens between now and February. So the declaration continued. Um, 
Newsom's interesting in this regard. He does a lot of things with great fanfare. He's very adept at getting attention, social media and so forth, uh, to the point where he's now talked about as a as a potential national candidate. Sometimes, Mo, he does things without so much fanfare. And here's a good example. On the last day in January, Governor Newsom signed a proclamation ending 26 open states of emergency in California dating back to 2017. Let me repeat that. 26 open states of emergency. Mo, we're talking fires, winter storms, monkeypox was on the list. <laughs> Can you argue that California maybe takes this to the extreme? Um, well, I mean, if you're if you're in favor of limited government, as yes. I think I am, I, uh, you probably do have a tendency to judge things in that direction. Yeah. But uh, it's also, I, it, one I'm sure this strikes you, you've been here much longer than I have, uh, California is really up there, and it turns out the number of ways to stop anything from happening. Yes. And so you can really understand how, especially when something really does appear to be an emergency, like, say, fires and so forth. Well, there's there's different categories here. I mean, one of the reasons you declare emergencies on things like fires, earthquakes, is to get money. Uh, you just want the federal money to come flowing in as fast as you can. And there's also, by the way, very uh, strong evidence in the political science literature that governors profit from very quick infusions of money during emergency uh, emergencies. That uh, even if you don't get the money to declare an emergency and and ask for it uh, has an electoral payoff. But so I think California it just it's just very hard to do anything. And so I can really understand how a governor uh, can just be tempted to say, "I'm going to declare an emergency and be done be done with this. I'll be able to do something rather than trying to fight it through the legislature and all the court suits, et cetera, et cetera." I think California had a rather unique uh, distinction at the beginning of the year, Mo. Uh, we already were under a, a drought uh, emergency, and then it rained like nobody's business, and the governor declared a flood emergency. So at the same time, <laughs> we were both uh, dry as dust, but also flooded. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So are any good government groups, Mo, looking at state powers and looking at the question of emergency authority? I'm looking at, for example, the National Conference of State Legislators, which at all times love to example how love to examine how states go about their practices. I have I have not been aware of any. I, I did give a um, a Zoom presentation like this to a um, to an organization of state legislative employees, and um, and but other than that, I mean, when I wrote the polarization books, I was immediately contacted by all sorts of good government groups um, yes. wanting me to sign on and sort of wanting advice, be on the board, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing like that has happened with the emergency powers book. Now, of course, you know, it's really only been out for a month. So we might, but but I think these. I mean, it's it's bad in a way that these kinds of questions are just not as sexy as sort of electoral and uh, and these are sort of they're philosophical, they're legal, and I don't think they grab the popular imagination quite as much. Uh, we have seen, as we do, we point out in chapter eight, quite a bit of pushback on the part of legislatures, and I, I'm sure when this all broke. Most state legislators had no idea that these powers existed. I think they've just never been used in our lifetime. These these kind of lockdowns and, and sort right. of, uh, things we're talking about here, and uh, and so there has been quite a bit of pushback. And we talk about all the, uh, the successful ones mostly in the uh, in chapter, I believe it's chapter eight. Uh, and so I, I think the database is sort of updated some from what it was originally when we we uh, compiled it in the, in the summer of 2020. Uh, well, Mo, it may seem academic, it may seem wonky, but I would argue the, uh, to the contrary that actually there are real real ramifications for what goes on here. And California and Texas is a good example. So let's go to the second part of the book, which is emergency powers and practice. And you have uh, chapters in it which talk about California's approach to public health authority and Texas's approach to public health authority. And no surprise, I hope everybody is sitting down. California and Texas go about this a little differently. Um, let's begin with the Golden State or California here. Uh, what's interesting about California, I find, Mo, is uh, for as much grief as Gavin Newsom got during the course of uh, COVID restrictions, uh, he ultimately was a subject of a recall election in uh, November of uh, 2021 that uh, failed. Uh, he actually was hands-off in at least one regard. If you look at COVID decisions, they are left to county health officers, um, and these are people who, A, are unelected, 
and B, aren't necessarily scientists. I would point you, for example, to Los Angeles County, Barbara Ferrer, who is the chief health officer of Los Angeles County. She's Dr. Ferrer, but she has a doctor, well, a PhD in social welfare. So she is not mm. she is not an MD by any means. And so anyway, I mention this because I think this feeds into something which you were alluding to earlier about the uh, sort of arbitrary nature of, of the COVID lockdowns in California. I you live in San Mateo County. I live in Santa Clara County, which is next door. I'm in Palo Alto. I get my hair cut in San Mateo County. So I would have to hop in my car, put on my mask, and then once I'd cross the county line, the mask would come off. And so for a wonderful hour, I wouldn't have to wear my mask. But then after I got my hair cut, get back in my car, go back home, put on my mask again. And at a certain point, people kind of wonder, this is a strange existence, isn't it? So California, how did California Mo get in the situation where you had unelected officials making these policy decisions. It would seem to me this is why you elect people. Yeah, I, I don't know how the, what the original idea, but yeah, we certainly saw, I mean, the difference between San Mateo and Santa Clara could have been a case study in and of itself. I already mentioned this uh, earlier, that our San Mateo County just was much less restricted. Stanford sports were affected in this way, that the football team we put out in the book uh, was not allowed to practice in Santa Clara County on campus, so they would get on buses and right. bus up to Woodside High School in San Mateo County. Now, it's unclear what health benefits could have been served by <laughs> packing these guys into buses, moving them, coming back like that. Same thing with the, the Stanford women's basketball team. They were on the road for, I mean, their whole season they, was. They, did, they didn't play a home game. They played down in Santa, play home played home. games down in Santa Cruz. Yeah, yeah. and and the, the, uh, uh, the San Jose State football team, which hadn't been, had a bowl game in ages, just said, screw it. And they got on the plane and went to their bowl game in, in defiance of the county health officer's orders. Yeah, it was, uh, it, the, the orders left a lot of discretion uh, to the county health officers. And as you say, uh, San, uh, Santa Clara's health officer was very strict on, on things. Also enforcement, that another thing we find out, and again, this, I'm not having done this kind of work in my whole life, mm -hmm. uh, it was sort of a shock to realize that in about 2,000 of the nation's 3,000 counties, Sheriffs are the principal law enforcement officer. You know, we think of all the police departments in the big cities, and that's the way it is. But in most counties, the sheriff is the, the top person, and a whole lot of sheriffs just said, not enforcing this. You know, they, they are elected. That's the important thing. And so the pressures they were under were very different from the, and the incentives they faced were very different from the incentives faced by county health officers. Right. Well, one of the challenges there, Mo, is just the practicality of how to carry out the enforcement. And California is notorious for doing this. I would point you, for example, to our hands-free driving laws. This was uh, put into law by a lawmaker named Joe Simidian, who is uh, from Palo Alto. These parts, it makes all the sense in the world. What the law says is that if uh, Mo Fiorina is driving down the highway, he can't uh, be looking at his device and playing with the device while he's driving. He's going to have an accident. Well, the only problem with that law is, well, it makes common sense. How do you enforce it? And I just, I remember uh, I would randomly walk up and down streets in Palo Alto during rush hour and just kind of look into people's cars, not being too much of a creep, but just looking at people's cars. Everybody had their head down looking at their device and they'd start inching forward looking at the device. The point is, Mo, you didn't have cops in every corner, you know, citing people with tickets. You just can't enforce these. And so this is one of the problems that California ran into in terms of how to actually enforce or not. But let's, let's shift now and look at Texas, where we had a different COVID response. And this was Governor Abbott and city and county officials. So how did Texas differ from California? Well, Texas, uh, Texas differs in, this was interesting that the uh, the county judge, I'd never heard of that before, is the principal official in most Texas counties. And right. so, and they have enormous power. And so uh, the, the Texas group just went to considerable length talking about this, uh, the, the way things are done and enforced in Texas. And it was highly decentralized that, um, that they had a great deal of, um, of variation in, as opposed to say like Houston, Austin, Etc. As compared to a lot of the outlying regions and so forth, and so um, it, I mean, it's a state that's geographically very large, uh, like California is, uh, but uh, but the governor didn't sort of impose the same kinds of uniformity in Texas that Governor Newsom imposed in California. Right. Very well. Uh, I think one thing which I found interesting reading the book and the part on Texas, uh, you saw a dichotomy among public officials, Mo. For example, Lieutenant Governor, he wasted no time going on Fox News and trashing lockdowns. He played to very much a red meat audience. At the same time, though, in Texas, you had big city mayors who were listening to science and health officers. So uh, did you find this surprising to see this sort of you know, dichotomy, if you will, and how these officials approach their jobs? No. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm not surprised by much of anything in American politics anymore. Yeah. And, uh, the, uh, 
they don't run on ticket in, in Texas either, you know, so the, the guy has an independent power base. Um, so no, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about doing this project is my research and research in most political sciences is nationally focused. And so to realize the incredible variation uh, that goes on in the American states, and we always talk, there's the old saying about how the states are the laboratories of democracy. We really have to be studying state politics more uh, just to see how institutional arrangements work out differently, that we tend to think of just the national pattern as the only pattern, but there's actually 50 other patterns of uh, legislatures, executives, and judiciaries, and it turns out in their actual operation, they vary enormously. Yeah, this seems to me to have been one of the problems once uh, we got uh, deep into the COVID crisis. Uh, you had a lot of politicians engaging in what I'd call performative politics. Uh, this is a conservative going on Fox News, a liberal going on MSNBC, uh, and basically just kind of saying what the echo chamber wants to hear. I don't remember too many Daniels in the Lion's End moments where a politician of one stripe went on a network of a different audience and actually tried to explain what he or she was doing. I think, I think that is largely true. There were a few cases of where uh, I think uh, Mike DeWine in Ohio mm -hmm. was was pretty good. He was, you know, I mean, he and in most in most cases where we saw state conflict, it was between a Republican governor and Democratic legislature, right? Uh, or a Democratic. There are actually only a couple of those, but mostly a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. Uh, DeWine was actually facing Republican legislature. Uh, being right. Republican, and yet he still had a lot of conflicts, and he he tried to explain exactly why uh, he was doing the things he was doing, and one of the things it brings out is is people have different constituencies, and uh, when you think about people in legislatures, they respond to local districts. Some of them are being hammered uh, economically; others are in big city minority neighborhoods where the virus is running wild, and uh, and then the governor, meanwhile, is the governor of the entire state and has a much more state outlook. And we I think we saw. Uh, and then when you look at Democratic governors, their constituency is public sector workers uh, who are working remotely and uh, and not being laid off for, in most cases. Repub Republican governors are facing constituencies of private business and who are being hammered uh, by the right. COVID uh, epi uh, shutdowns. And so we, I think we saw a lot of just how different politicians responded to different electoral coalitions uh, during the during the pandemic. Right. Now, somebody who did do a lot of media and showed up on all sorts of circles was Dr. Anthony Fauci. But again, here we're getting back to the premise of the book and maybe one of the lessons we've learned here. Dr. Fauci was, at the end of the day, you know, an authority on this topic, but also an unelected official. And you can argue the more that Fauci was on television, the more it probably raised questions in the minds of some people. Why is he the one on TV talking? And is he the one making the decisions? Is Should he be the person in charge here? Yeah, I think the, the really... If someone asked me, what is the fundamental question of the book? Yep. It is, as the title says, just who governs, who, governs, right. who makes the decisions. And and uh, I get at this specifically in the last chapter that I wrote, that um, these decisions have been delegated to specialists. And the problem with specialists, and I include myself among them, is we have tunnel vision. Yes. That uh, we tend to sort of think in terms of the categories we're trained in and what we focus on. And so if, just take another example, if you, we were to ask people, social scientists, about income inequality, well, the economists will talk about globalization and returns to skills mm -hmm. and automation, et cetera. And you go to the political scientists and they say, yeah, well, there's all that, but there's also a progressive taxation and there's policies that create a more generous safety net. And you go to the sociologists and they say, yeah, there's all that, but there's also a sort of assortative matings and all these various sociological factors they point out. We, we tend to see the world through our own specialized lenses. And public health officials are trained to see the world through public health. Uh, Dr. Fauci and these other officials may be the greatest virologists and epidemiologists in the world, but they are not specialists in economics. They are not right. experts in mental health. They are not experts in education. There are just all sorts of other things that are implicated in what they're doing. And the, the way the emergency powers have been structured and the way they're carried out simply gives short shrift to all of these other considerations and by placing them in the hands of a certain occupational specialty. So I really think that if I could do, if I were czar, of uh, the country, the one thing I would do is change the emergency power, the ability to, to impose them to ensure that a sort of a broader committee of some sort, it couldn't just be a, a county health officer, there would have to be some input from people representing other committees. Um, I point out, okay, put an economist on the, on the committee, 
put a, uh, a childhood education specialist on the committee, put a psychologist on the committee. Right. And all these things are coming out now that people realize a whole lot of things uh, were, were suffered under the, the lockdown period and so forth. Uh, teachers, my wife is a retired teacher and my daughter-in-law is a teacher. And the kids lost a year of socialization. They, my daughter-in-law says the, the second graders are actually first graders in terms of their social maturity and so forth. That, that basically there were real costs uh, done. And these were not factored into the way the lockdowns were carried out. So I would like to see a, a more representative body, uh, e even though we realize there are things have to happen quickly. Uh, things have, have to, a lot of ordinary politics has to be transcended. But nevertheless, I would like to see just a little more input, a lot more input actually into making these kinds of huge decisions. That's a great point, Mo, and a word that comes to mind is accountability. So back when you would have first been teaching America and the world were saying goodbye to Harry Truman, uh, Harry Truman had a very interesting post-presidency, and it's kind of worth mentioning, uh, given uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, situation. Uh, Truman left office. He was very unpopular when he left office. He kept a very low profile in his post-presidency. And then in the early 1970s, coinciding um, with his with his passing, um, the country fell in love with Harry Truman. There was the James Whitmore play, Give Him Hell Harry. There was the uh, David McCullough book. And suddenly we had a wave of nostalgia with regard to Truman. It coincided with Watergate, and whereas Watergate raised questions about trust in government. Here is honest Harry Truman, who, of course, had the sign on his desk saying the buck stops here. And this, to me, most seems one of the problems with America's experiment with COVID lockdowns and COVID policy. It's a question at the end of the day is where does the buck stop? I agree completely. And I think in my lifetime, accountability in general in the United States, federal, state, local city has diminished. And, uh, and in part because, uh, you know, you don't want to look back too too fondly on days of corruption and spoil system and so forth. But there used to be somebody responsible at the top. There used to be a mayor responsible for everything that happened in the city yes. uh, or, or the county Democratic chairman or Republican chair. Uh, now we have zoning boards, recreation boards, uh, preservation boards, et cetera. And who's responsible? So nothing happens with homelessness, for example, or nothing happens to some other local issue. and. Who do, who do the voters hold responsible? There's simply in so many uh, municipal, it's really obvious, I think, but uh, in, 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 the, in the, the country as a whole, divided government, do we, do we hold a Republican president, Democratic House? You know, who is responsible or vice versa? Um, and I just think accountability in the country has gotten more and more difficult for voters to impose. For, and that is critical that politicians have to know they're going to be held accountable. And right now they can, and it's not, it's not they're lying about being not accountable. There is just so much diffusion of authority that in most cases, no one politician can be held accountable legitimately. But I think it's a, it's a sad situation to be in. One thing I enjoyed about the book, Mo, statistics, lots and lots of statistics, lots and lots of poll numbers. You actually backed up things with scientific proof. Let's talk about a couple of poll numbers here. First of all, I found a rather interesting dichotomy. Um, you pointed out in the book that there is a um, that when asked about uh, whether COVID was a major threat to the population, uh, Democrats, about 85 percent of Democrats said it was only uh 46% of Republicans thought it was a, quote, major threat to the population. But then when you pose the question differently, Mo, and you ask, is COVID an economic threat? The two sides come together. They pretty much see the world the same on that. So how, how would you explain that difference, where on the one hand, you don't see it a threat to the population, but you see it a threat to the economy? I, I think probably just because they made a different trade-off um, that I mentioned a few moments ago. The parties have different bases. And Republicans tend to be a more private sector party. Democrats tend to be a more public sector party. Right. And I, arguably, the economic costs of the, uh, of the uh, I don't think it's arguable, I think it's true, that the economic costs of the lockdowns were heavier on the private sector than they were in the public sector. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, government kept right on working. The workers just went home. Uh, there, the expression came out, the laptop class. Yes, And it meant the people who could go right on working us in the universities, people in government, in the nonprofits, et cetera, uh, kept going right on working. It was inconvenient. Uh, it was lonely. But nevertheless, our, our paychecks didn't go down. Whereas uh, in the real economy, um, people went out of business. Restaurants went under. Companies went under. And a lot of money was pumped into the economy, of course. But nevertheless, the immediate economic costs 
were much heavier on the private sector. And so it's not surprising that uh, that Republicans uh, should have made a different trade-off. They were, they were seeing the economic costs to a greater extent than Democrats were. These are tendencies, of course. I'm not saying every Democrat, every Republican, but just clear statistical tendencies. Uh, another polling stat that caught my eye, most school closings at the beginning of the of the pandemic, both Democrats and Republicans were largely in favor of school closings. I think it was 95% Democrats and 85% Republicans. Then you point out within a year, 66% of Democrats still support school closing, but the Republican side has now collapsed to 25%. Yeah. Yeah, this, this was a case really where uh, we heard a whole lot about trust to science. Yes. And then we saw the limits of that when we ran into school closings because the teachers unions in the big cities stopped it. And it got to the point, we, we discussed this in some detail in the, in the essay, but you had the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle calling for the reopening of the schools and the uh, liberal outlets of all sorts. And schools were open in Europe, school, private schools were open, charter schools were open, and yet the big city school systems were closed. And this was clearly an example of political power. And uh, and doesn't surprise people, I think, although I think the strength of the uh, of the unions uh, perhaps did surprise people. And I think there's a long term cost, as you uh, as you know, uh, the public school population has declined. Right. The private school population, Catholic schools, in many cases, were on the ropes economically, and suddenly there's this clamoring for people to get into Catholic schools because they're open and they're educating people. And uh, so, I mean, I'm, I think there was a real long-term cost that the teachers unions paid, not only their reputation, but to their membership uh, over this. But that's probably the, the biggest example I think of in the pandemic about sort of the limits of science versus politics. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Mo, can you address the correlation between political identities and COVID restrictions? Yeah, I mean, it's really complicated, I think, that, that as, I, as I mentioned, uh, if you think of yourself, um, Republicans are more individualistic, uh, right. the, the sort of so the idea, I'll make decisions that affect me on my own. And I think Democrats tend to be more communitarian. Uh, they, they tend to think not just me, but how do my actions affect others as well? Again, these are just statistical tendencies, not talking about every Democrat, every Republican. Right. And uh, I think Republicans believe more in limited government. I think Democrats believe in government, using government to do things. I think all these things sort of compile and uh, Republicans are, are older. You know, one of the interesting things was um, a lot of older people, I include myself among them, never got that frightened. And, and I think one of the reasons was we've been through these things before. I, uh, we were college seniors, uh, my, my age group, when the Hong Kong flu ripped through the United States. And I, I actually had, wasn't aware of it until I read about it in connection with COVID, that there was a major flu epidemic my senior year of college. 1957. And I asked my wife, do you remember anything about this? She said, no, there was really. And I, and I think the notion that, and there was, there was another one when we were 11 years old, I believe, like, which one that was called, but um, but I think older generations have actually been through a lot of um, a, a lot of scares like this, not just scares, but actual pandemics, and more than younger people have. That we we've raised a young generation that has really come grown up in a remarkably nice time without major wars, without huge depressions until very recently. Uh, and I think probably for younger, and again, Democrats tend to skew younger, Republicans tend to skew older. Um, I think there was just a sense of, okay, this happens every now and then, we'll get through it. Whereas for younger people, it was a more serious and a newer uh, kind of, we went through polio, we went through all these. We, we grew up during an era when there were, we weren't enough. My first hospital stated in that penicillin yet was strep throat. You know, and so uh, you know, I, I just think there were there was a, a perspective on the part of the older generation that we were concerned, but it didn't sort of strike us as deeply. And so we add all these things together, I think, and it, it turns out that people with a, a liberal or a, a democratic identity were more likely to 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 sort of be willing to make more trade offs, more sacrifices. Uh, to stay safe than I think some of the older, more Republican, more conservative elements of the population. 
I'd like to see your colleagues, Dave Brady and Doug Rivers, do some polling on this, Mo, because um, I one area about this that interests me is um, so your generation, my generation too now, I'm getting up in age two, how we get information, where we go for news and how we process things. I don't think you're the kind of person who's walking around staring at your phone all day sure. and refreshing Twitter every 30 seconds. In other words, kind of sort of reacting to constant outrage and constant things written in caps and things like that. And maybe this is part of the problem we saw during COVID that we started a point of national unity, but things quickly kind of fell apart in part because people turned to the rather familiar familiar sources for news, which did their best to just sort of confuse and chum the waters and just drive people apart. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and one of the interesting things that emerged pretty early, and I forget who did this study, but uh, the American media was much more negative in its coverage of COVID than yes. the European media. The, uh, the expression I used was they managed to find the, the dark lining in every silver cloud. That right. there was never good news. There, any good news was always counterbalanced, but however, that there was something bad about this. Whereas the Europeans were much more likely to trumpet the, the, the efficacy of vaccines and how things were getting better, et cetera. And that was across the board. That, that the media, the, the legacy media in particular. So I suppose if you ignored the legacy media, um, you were probably less likely to be frightened or less likely to be concerned, uh, hmm. again, relatively yeah. speaking, than people who sort of were in the New York Times and the uh, Memphis NBC, et cetera, uh, all the time. All right. So let me read to you, Mo, a passage uh, from the last essay. The title of it is COVID Restrictions and Democratic Governance. This will sound familiar because you wrote this. And here's what you wrote, and I quote, no large-scale society operates under unanimity rules. Consequently, in real-world democracy, some interests win and some lose in normal policymaking. But at a minimum, democracy demands that all significant interests have a chance to be heard, to have a seat at the table. The experience of the COVID pandemic raises questions about whether this has been the case. Now, you mentioned a few minutes ago that it'd be nice to put together some sort of committee tribunal, if you will, to investigate things. My question, Mo, is your confidence in government actually exploring what we're going to do the next time this happens, because we can agree, I think, that pandemics like this are not a matter of if, but a when uh, down the road. I look at Washington right now, Mo, and what do I see? I see House Republicans have launched a probe into the origins of the virus. They will interview Anthony Fauci and ultimately try to try to you know sully his reputation. There'll certainly be investigations into how COVID relief money was spent and so forth. But what I noticed missing from this, Mo, is any kind of federal commission, any kind of good government commission that's really looking into the question of not just who governs, but how we can govern better, how we can do a better job during an emergency. Yeah, I think the, uh, the the partisan polarization at the federal level is so deep now that I think yeah. uh, that's the last place we can look to for progress. And I think it will have to come from organizations like No Labels, the Third Way, uh, some of the good government groups that have um, come up in the past. Unfortunately, as I said, they've tended to be more concerned with things like campaign finance, uh, ranked choice voting, uh, primary reform, things like that. And uh, this is just, especially as the, as the, I mean, the unfortunate thing about human behavior is as the pandemic recedes, attention is going to decline. And uh, I fear that this might all just become a historical footnote until the next, uh, the next time it comes. And I, I, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> all I can do is, uh, is write and say, here are my concerns and hope that somebody picks up on it. But what, what happened during the we, when they went to look at uh, respirator equipment, they found that it had been packed away for so long that it all deteriorated. That uh, I think the uh, the concern, the concern, the attention is just going to sort of dry up and go away uh, unless we get another one really quickly. Let's close by talking about a, uh, a topic which you get asked a lot about, and that is polarization. Uh, I hope you've rested up because we're now entering a presidential cycle, and you, Dr. Fiorina, are in for 18 to 20 months of questions about how polarized is our society. Is this election the most polarized? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, two questions for you. Number one, really, to what extent is um, the American electorate polarized? But secondly, Mo, what has the COVID experience done with regard to polarization? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and this is a good opportunity to make a clarification that I've been trying to make for 20 years without a lot of success. Yes. And that is, the electorate is not polarized, any more polarized today than it was in Jimmy Carter's era, in terms of the extremity of people's opinions. That right. If you look at public opinion, it looks the same, it's just a big U-shaped distribution, big uh, uh, bell-shaped distribution. 
You look at the ideological identification, just the same. 40% of the country says I'm a moderate or a middle of the roader. You look at partisanship, 75% of the country during the Eisenhower year said I'm a Democrat or Republican. It's only 60% today. It's 40% won't even admit they have a party affiliation. What has changed and what the point I keep trying to make is sorting that within that constant overall electorate, the electorate is sorted out ideologically and policy-wise. So that in the simple way to express it is, there used to be a lot of Joe Manchin Democrats in the Democratic Party. And right. starting in the 80s, that just sort of began to weaken and then really accelerating in the last 15 years or so. There used to be a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Christine Todd Whitman, Rudy Giuliani type Republicans. Mm -hmm. And again, they have gradually been weeded out both by replacement that just dying off and younger people going into the other party and by conversion, but mostly replacement. And so, so the fact is we now have party polarization. We have the Democrats and Republicans who are more distinct and more conflictual than it have ever really been in our history, but there's still 40% of the country are more standing on the sidelines that they're not, and, and actually more than that, because the, the really polarized people, the ones you see on Fox News, the ones you see writing the letters to, uh, the ones you see on Twitter, for example, there's something crazy. I wrote a paper recently on the whole social media thing, but Twitter is something like 6% of the adult public in the United States accounts for 99% of all the political tweets and retweets on Twitter. Right. Now, who do you think those 6% are? They are the wingnuts of the electorate. And People, reporters, one of the an interesting study found that reporters take their view of public opinion from Twitter. They're all yes. on Twitter. And so th there's the people who write about politics in the U.S. are hopelessly <laughs> sort of uninformed about what the American electorate actually looks like, the American electorate as a whole. And so we do have at the elite level this tremendously party polarized electorate, which is why what you're talking about in Washington is the way it is. But at the mass level, that phases up. I, if somebody made me czar again, I could take issues like abortion and gay rights and so forth and design a referendum that would get 60% of the country in support of it. It would not please either the 10% of extreme liberals or the 10% of extreme conservatives, but most people in the middle could say, I can live with that. You know, and that's the case with a whole lot of issues in the country today, but the political system doesn't offer those choices to the public. You get things that are too Democratic or too Republican. Uh, and then in a midterm election, people say, I didn't vote for that. And they should flip the other way and sort of ping ponging back and forth from election to election. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Mo, COVID's role in all of this and the lockdowns and COVID policy. Uh, what comes to mind is just America's problems with institutions. We seem to be having a vast institutional crisis in this country and add government to the list. Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lessons, takeaways from this? <laughs> <laughs> this is well, if you've ever noticed, every academic book or article tends to end with a weak concluding chapter or a weak concluding section. And the reason is editors and publishers won't let you get away with just the analysis. They say, well, you got to end on a high note. Yes. You've got to have something positive to say, something a positive takeaway. And typically we don't have any, uh, which is the case uh, with me, that uh, all I know is that something that can't go on forever won't, in the words of some old economist. And so uh, this too shall pass. Uh, I don't know when, how it comes about, but we will. We've, we have muddled through so many worse periods in our history. And that's another thing, another problem with not teaching history in schools anymore is people don't realize what a troubled, violent history the United States has had from the beginning. Again, right. partly because we lived through a remarkably, I, I phrased, I called it at one point, a, a holiday from history. Uh, for a period. And that's not normal. And even if you just grew up in the 60s, uh, you know that things can be worse uh, than they are now. And so uh, this will pass. Uh, we'll get out of it somehow. Uh, I don't know how or when, but I'm confident my children and my grandchildren will continue on in the United States of America. Here's how you please your publisher and leave things on a hopeful note. End the book by saying, I'll have more to say about this in my next book. <laughs> <laughs> Which does lead to our final question, Mo. What are you working on these days, and uh, what can we be expecting from you out of the Hoover Institution in the near future? What are you working on? Social media. Um, I, I just became um, the tendency of the part of political scientists anytime they hear a big claim is to say, yeah, yeah, what's the evidence for that? 
Right. As I looked into all the talk about, you know, Facebook destroyed democracy um, and we should Twitter, we should censor Twitter and all these things. I thought, what's the real evidence for that? So I, I did a deep dive in the literature, uh, not on what journalists are talking about, echo chambers and so forth, but what are people actually doing online? And it turns out there's a large literature in computer science and other areas which studies actual tweets. And I, I just cited a few tweets and posts and everything. And it turns out that just as uh, I've pointed out how few people actually read the New York Times or listen to Fox News or so forth, it turns out when you get to social media, it's even smaller. Yep. That it's typically the case that on any, any uh, site like Facebook, any platform like Facebook or Twitter or Google, that it's three to 5% of the adult population that is doing anything political at all. So this is just sort of the latest playpen for the political junkies uh, to, to frolic in. And echo chambers, they don't exist, for example. It's just the evidence for those is totally negative. Uh, the evidence for social, social media polarizing people, it's not there. In fact, the evidence suggests that polarized people go to social media, that the causality runs the other way. They, they need their, their fix of red meat every morning, like the rest of us need our coffee. And, uh, and so I, I wrote a long paper on that, which was circulated to some of the big names in the field. And I think we're going to do a conference at Hoover. Uh, next year on this, uh, uh, Chris Dower is interested in doing this, where we bring together a, sort of a, a number of the big names who write papers on this and have a real discussion on uh, the problems that social media present for democracy. I'm not talking about childhood, uh, you know, adolescent uh, mental health and so forth. That's a different question. But is social media a threat to democracy? And uh, I think we're going to try to bring together a group of people and critics and young people and get them get them working on this. Uh, this is a big subject. It's just getting bigger. And uh, before we go jumping in at the federal level on various kinds of censorship and so forth, we already really know what kind of problem, the contours of the problem we're dealing with. So that's my sort of next probably two years and then I'm going to retire. I think that's a great topic, Mo. And uh, here's the thought. Why don't you get a group of nine, another magnificent nine to ride together again? And why don't you put together a series of essays on that? And you can come back on the book club. We might do that. Thank you. Okay. Well, for you, and thanks for dropping by the book club today. And congratulations on yet another terrific book. The title of it, Who Governs? Emergency Powers in the Time of COVID is published by Hoover Press, which you can find by going to hoover.org. While on hoover.org, by the way, I strongly encourage you to sign up for the Hoover Daily Report, which delivers the best work of Mo Fiorina and his colleagues to your inbox each and every workday. For the Hoover Institution, I'm Bill Whalen. We'll be back soon with another installment of the Hoover Book Club. Until then, take care. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.